In the 12th century BCE, the world of the Bronze Age came to a sudden and violent end. Crises and turmoil plagued many great civilizations of the age, with their inevitable downfall coming at the hands of a vaguely attested seafaring alliance, which we today know as the Sea Peoples. One of the groups that constituated the Sea Peoples were the Peleset, who eventually came to settle in southern Canaan and carved centuries-long history for themselves. Here, we talk about the origins and history of the Peleset, or how we today better know them as the Philistines. In 1208 BCE, during the fifth regnal year of Pharaoh Meneptah, a large coalition embarked on the shores to the west of the Nile Delta. Ekwesh, Teresh, Luka, Sherdan, and Shekelesh came down from the midst of the Mediterranean Sea, allied with the ruler of Libya in his quest to invade the Egyptian kingdom. The wretched fallen chief of Libya, Meriri, son of Dead, had fallen upon the country of Tehenu with his bowmen, taking the best of every warrior and every man of war of his country. He has brought his wife and his children, leaders of the camp, and he has reached the western boundary in the fields of Periri. The Battle of Periri reportedly lasted for six hours, with Merneptah ultimately overcoming the invaders in a decisive victory. The pharaoh recorded killing 6,000 soldiers and taking 9,000 prisoners. This attempted invasion was the first time the Egyptians came face to face with a powerful sea coalition that was about to wreak chaos across the Bronze Age world. Merneptah then went to Canaan where the local rebellious tribes were attempting to take advantage of the situation and revolt against the authority of the pharaoh. Nevertheless, the Egyptians crushed the revolt, laying severe destruction to the city of Ascalon, as well as all of the surrounding lands that dared to oppose them. Among the defeated was also a tribe of Israelites which Pharaoh claims to have eradicated. In the victory stelae of Merneptah, he claims that Israel has been wiped out, and its seed is no more. Egypt now stood tall, with all of the external threats seemingly eliminated for the time being. However, something was brewing to the north, far outside of the reach of the Egyptian monarchs. The Sea Coalition may had been defeated once, but it was far from being destroyed. In fact, it was only getting bigger, with even more entities joining the Alliance. By the 12th century BCE, the coalition of the Sea Peoples still included Shekelesh, Sherden, and Teresh, but also the new members, Denian, Teeker, Weshesh, and Peleset. Their target, the great civilizations of the Eastern Mediterranean, including the Hittites, Alatia, Ugarit, and eventually Egypt. The Sea Peoples were not only looking to defeat the Eastern Kingdoms, but to settle in their lands. Warriors of the Peleset were reported to have brought their women and children in their boats as well, determined to conquer and colonize. There was no going back. Within a short period of time, likely less than a decade, the Sea Peoples took part in the destruction of the Hittite Empire, managed to destroy the Kingdom of Alatia on Cyprus, and burned Ugarit down to the ground. These events were duly noted by Egypt's new pharaoh, Ramses III. He reported that the coalition was encamping in the land of Amuru by the Levantine coast, with some of the Amorites, Shasu tribes and even Hittites joining the cause. Their next target was Egypt. The foreign countries made a conspiracy in their lands. All at once, the lands were removed and scattered in the fray. No land could stand before their arms. From Hatti, Kodi, Karkame, Sharzawa, and Alatia on, being destroyed at one time. 
A camp was set up in Amuru. They desolated its people, and its land was like that which has never come into being. They were coming forward towards Egypt, while the flame was prepared before them. Their confederation was the Peleset, Teyaker, Shekelesh, Denyan, and Washesh, lands united. They laid their hands upon the land as far as the circuit of the earth, their hearts confident and trusting. Our plans will succeed. The Peleset were noted for their distinctive equipment, including the so-called feathered headdress helmet, long swords, round shields and the lobster-style corsets for their armor. In about 1175 BCE, the Sea Peoples attacked Egypt by both land and sea. Ramses III, however, had more than enough time to prepare. He constructed a fleet which he stationed across the favorable positions of the Nile Delta. Likewise, the Egyptian army sallied out and met the invaders in southern Canaan. In both battles, the Egyptians were able to defeat the invaders, putting a definite end to their campaign. For some among the Sea Peoples, this would be the last time that history records them. But when it comes to the Peleset, they were about to enter the new chapter. In the aftermath of his reported victory, Ramses managed to come to terms with some of the invaders, most notably the Peleset and the Teyaker. According to Pharaoh's inscription at the mortuary temple at Medinet Habu, the Peleset were settled by Ramses in southern Canaan. It was the same territory around Ascalon where Merneptah had decimated the rebels a generation before, a land that was now to serve as the frontier of the Egyptian kingdom. Likewise, the Teyaker were settled in a port city of Dor for the north. Although Ramses misses no opportunity to showcase his strength and authority in the inscriptions, settlement of the Peleset and Teyaker at the Egyptian frontiers was possibly a pragmatic solution for a kingdom that was rather exhausted by constant warfare. Egypt's treasury was almost empty, there were food shortages across the kingdom, and its economy was in a severe decline. Collapse of the Bronze Age brought the end of several great civilizations, but also the end of the vast trade system that enabled Egypt to stay wealthy and powerful. Perhaps a settlement deal with the former sea peoples was the only choice that the pharaoh really had. It is possible that the Peleset were already in possession of the southern Canaanite coast prior to the Battle of the Delta, and then came to terms with the pharaoh to stay permanently settled there following his victory. Either way, the Egyptian records of the Peleset end at this point, as Egypt itself fell into irreversible decline, with economic turmoil and civil unrest, eventually leading to the fragmentation of the kingdom that would last for centuries. The existence of the Peleset, however, continued to be recorded, as they appear in the biblical sources of the ancient Hebrews. Here, they are recorded as the Peleshet or Pelishtim, and would become better known by the Greek rendering of the name, the Philistinoi or the Philistines. When it comes to the native Canaanites, they still existed in the area and most likely outnumbered the Philistine settlers. The two eventually blended, which is evident in each of the settlements that subsequently emerged in what became known as Philistia. The main Philistine cities were known as the Philistine Pentopolis, which included Ascalon, Ashdod, Gaza, Gath, and Ekron. When it comes to the Philistine origins, they were never specified by the Egyptian sources, except general connections of the Sea Peoples with the islands of the Mediterranean Sea and links of some of these seafaring groups to the Aegean. The Hebrew sources, however, do offer much more detail, recording Philistine origins at Kaftar in the Book of Amos of the Hebrew Bible. It reads, Are you not like Cushites to me, O children of Israel? declares the Lord. Did I not bring Israel up from the land of Egypt, the Philistines from Kaftor, 
and the Arameans from Kyr. Kaftar is generally agreed to be the island of Crete. It aligns with the Akkadian language term designating the island, which was Kaptara, as well as the Egyptian name for it, Keptiu. Throughout the Late Bronze Age, Crete was a part of the Mycenaean Greece. The Philistines undoubtedly show close cultural affinity with the Aegean, as well as the island of Cyprus, where the Mycenaeans established their colonies during the Bronze Age collapse. Philistine pottery, while clearly different to the native Canaanite, shows almost identical resemblance to the pottery of the Mycenaeans from the same period. Designs from Philistia, although locally made, are virtually the same as those found on Cyprus and throughout the Aegean. Mycenaean-style architecture is also present in the Philistine settlements. In Akron or Acheron, several Megaron-style buildings were built, including pebbled hearts, columns and multiple rooms. One of the buildings in the city's center includes Megaron with monumental entrance hall with two mushroom-shaped stone pillar bases, a style reminiscent of the Mycenaean rulers. Same characteristics when it comes to both pottery and architecture are displayed in all other cities of Philistia, Ashdod, Ascalon, Gaza and Goth. The burial customs of the Philistines unsurprisingly also resembled those of the Aegean. Chamber tombs and oval-shaped graves as well as ceramics, figurines and other burial contents all point to the Mycenaean origin of the new settlers. The language of the Philistines, however, is very poorly attested, since only vague fragments of it survive in the form of personal and toponymic names. They eventually adopted an alphabet very similar to that of the neighboring Phoenicians, who left strong influence on the whole region. This happened several centuries after the Philistine settlement, at a time when the DNA studies showed that the original Aegean settlers had already long blended into the native population. However, the remnants of the Philistine language show non-Semitic characteristics, possibly originated in the Mycenaean Greece. Likewise, little is known about the religion of the Philistines, especially in the early period. What we do know is that they eventually adopted many of the deities of the more numerous Canaanites, such as Baal, Astarte, Asherah, and Dagon. However, the most common religious artifacts were the goddess figurines, something that is very reminiscent of the Aegean cultures, perhaps a legacy that the Philistines carried on from the early times. The territory of Philistia bordered the city of Dor to the north, which was by the end of the Bronze Age settled by another former Sea People's group, the Teacher. Further north laid the coastal territories of the Phoenicians. To the south laid the Sinai Desert, beyond which was now increasingly fragmented the Egyptian kingdom. To the west of Philistia were the Canaanite territories, as well as the legendary twelve tribes of Israel. According to the biblical tradition, at the time when the Philistines had established themselves in southern Canaanite coast, the Israelites did not yet have a unified state, instead being divided into many tribes, ruled by their respective chieftains, in Bible known as the Judges. As southern Canaanites were gradually being conquered by both Philistines and Israelites, the two would come into contact and inevitably enter hostilities against one another. Likewise, the Teacher were soon overran, with the city of Dor being taken by the Phoenicians in the 11th century BCE. The Teacher themselves are not mentioned in the biblical sources. Events that are described in the Hebrew Bible, especially the early ones, can be viewed as closer to mythology rather than history and likely do not fully correspond with the historical contemporary records. The Philistines were first recorded battling the tribe of Judah. 
the Judeans managed to penetrate Philistia as far as Gaza, Ascalon and Ekron, but are eventually defeated and forced to withdraw. Another battle was then fought when the Philistines attempted to invade, being defeated by Israelite leader Shamgar and suffering 600 casualties. To the north, the tribe of Dan attempted to settle the coastal area around the city of Jopha, which was allocated to them following the Israelite defeat of the Canaanites. However, they were unable to do so due to the expansion and military superiority of the Philistines. Instead, the city would become the northernmost territory of Philistia. Perhaps the most notable of these early conflicts took place during the time of Samson, described as the final Israelite judge, tentatively corresponding to the 11th century BCE. In Bible, Samson is characterized by immense strength, and the Philistines are unable to defeat him in several encounters. Eventually, he is tricked by a woman named Dalila into telling her the secret that his strength came from his hair. Delilah then has his hair cut in his sleep, after which he is captured by the Philistines and imprisoned in Gaza. While being tied to the pillars of a temple during the Philistine gathering, Samson eventually manages to break the pillars, causing the whole temple to crumble, thus killing himself but also 3,000 of the Philistines. This time is considered as the period of the Philistine oppression over the Israelites, which led to yet another major conflict. A leader named Eli was recorded as the chieftain of Shiloh, on whose behalf a large Israelite army was raised. Israelites gathered in Ebenezer, while the Philistines set up camp at the city of Aphek. As the battle takes place, the Philistines are victorious, with the Israelite army suffering 4,000 casualties. However, leaders of the Israelite forces, Eli's two sons Hophni and Phinehas, decide on yet another attempt, this time at the Battle of Aphek. They also brought the sacred Ark of the Covenant from the city of Shiloh, believing that it would provide luck necessary to gain the upper hand in the battle. However, the Israelites are once again sadly mistaken, with the Philistine army scoring a decisive and crushing victory. 30,000 Israelite warriors are killed in the battle, Hophni and Phinehas among them. The Divine Ark is taken by the Philistines. Once the disastrous news reached Eli, the aging leader fell backwards out of his chair, where he broke his neck and tragically died as well. The Philistine captivity of the Ark, however, brought them several bad omens and misfortunes. Eventually, they decided to return it to the land of Israel. One of the inhabitants of Shiloh was a figure named Samuel, who would soon play a key role in pivoting away from the Israelite system of judges into a more unified realm. Twenty years after the Philistine victory and subsequent hegemony over Israel, Samuel gathered his people in Mizpah, aiming to end the Philistine oppression. As the Philistine army attacked, they were this time decisively defeated and forced to flee for their lives. Samuel eventually declared his sons Joel and Abiah as his successors. However, this was rejected by the Israelites, who demanded to elect a king who would lead the unified state. Aging Samuel held assembly at Gilgal, eventually electing Saul, the first king of the unified Israel. Only two years into Saul's reign, hostilities with the Philistines were renewed, with the Israelite army under Saul's son Jonathan raiding the Philistine garrison in Geba. In response, the Philistines assembled a large army numbering as many as 3,000 chariots, 6,000 cavalry, and thousands more in infantry. They encamped in Mihmash, from where they ravaged the Israelite territory. 
the Israelites were eventually able to launch a surprise attack which shocked the Philistines, forcing them to flee Michmash and allowing King Saul to claim another victory. It is possible, although not explicitly stated, that the Philistine city of Gath during this time was ruled by a king named Maok, who is stated as the father and predecessor of Achish, a well-known ruler of Gath, in the events that were soon to follow. Either way, the Philistines were far removed from accepting defeat. Another army was raised and sent towards Israel to meet Saul on the field of battle. It is here that the Bible records the famed story of David and Goliath. Goliath of Gath is described as a giant and the Philistine champion who issued a challenge to single combat to the Israelites, a challenge that none were willing to accept. Eventually, young David rose to the occasion, slaying Goliath with a sling, and thus allowing King Saul to be victorious. However, problems between Saul and increasingly popular David soon arose, and the latter was forced to flee Israel. David thus goes to Philistia, where he is accepted by Achish, the king of Gath. Akish then appoints David as the governor of Ziklag, close to the border with Judah. Although Akish seemed to have trusted David, his compatriots did not, and thus David was left behind when Akish raised his army and marched towards Israel for yet another war against Saul. In the subsequent battle of Mount Gilboa, the Philistines secured a decisive victory. King Saul, together with three of his sons, including Jonathan, all lost their lives. Upon hearing the news, David leaves Philistia and returns to Israel, where after a brief civil war, he is proclaimed the king of the land. Predictably, this did not sit well with the Philistines, who would yet again declare war and march on Israel. However, David manages to score repeated victories at the Valley of the Giants. David's forces then manage to secure several new triumphs, each represented by a killing of a Philistine giant. It is possible that Gath was ruled by a king named Maka at this time. Either way, the Philistine power was greatly diminished during David's reign. In Gath, Makkah was succeeded by his son, also named Akish. On the other hand, in Israel, David's son Solomon became the new ruler. Although Solomon reportedly received tribute from the Philistines, he would be the final ruler of the unified Israel. After his death, which is hypothetically dated to about 930 BCE, the unified kingdom was split into two realms, Israel and Judah. It is during the 10th century BCE that we slowly enter the historical times. The biblical tradition, although still partially reliant on legendary stories, can at least be verified to a degree by the contemporary historical sources. While biblical tradition still records continuous clashes the Philistines had with both Israel and Judah, the Egyptian sources start shedding light to the events of the region, as the realm of the pharaohs was finally recovering and looked to once again expand towards Canaan. Although some scholars believe that the Egyptians launched a campaign into Philistia as early as the first half of the 10th century BCE during the reign of Pharaoh Siamon, the first definite evidence that we have of the Egyptian involvement in the region comes from the reign of Pharaoh Shashank I. Shoshank founded Egypt's 22nd dynasty in the second half of the 10th century, which ruled mainly over the eastern Nile Delta. The pharaoh launched a campaign into Levant, reportedly penetrating through Philistia, Israel, Phoenicia, and as far as Syria to the north. He celebrated his victories on a monument called the Megiddo Stelae. 
Shawshank died in 922 BCE, being succeeded by his son, Ozarkon I. Unlike his father, Ozarkon focused more on the building projects across the kingdom and overall prosperity of Egypt, rather than destruction across the Levant, allowing Philistines to recover and reportedly resume hostilities against their neighbors. Hebrew Bible records renewed hostilities the Philistines had with the Kingdom of Israel towards the end of the 10th century. The Israelite king Nadab attempted an evasion as he laid siege on the Philistine-controlled city of Gibbethon. However, he ultimately failed, being assassinated by one of his own men, named Basha. Although the Bible then records a contemporary ruler of Judah, named Asa, scoring a stunning victory over a king named Zerah, corresponding to Pharaoh Ozarkon II, this is very unlikely to have happened as the Bible describes. Philistia, Judah and Israel were likely somewhat under the Egyptian sphere of influence during this time, as Ozarkon passed through Judah with a large army in 853 BCE on his way to face the growing power of Assyria. By the mid-9th century BCE, the Philistines were said to have made allies with some of the Arabic tribes to the south in order to launch a new war against Judah, then ruled by a king named Yehorah. The Philistine army invaded Judah in 843 BCE, piercing through the territory and reaching its capital, Jerusalem. Judeans were decisively defeated. Jerusalem, together with its royal palace, is ransacked, with all of King Jeroham's wives and most of his sons taken prisoner. Less than two years later, Jehoram himself passed away. The later part of the 9th century is also possibly the time to which we can date the names of some of the historical Philistine rulers. According to the later 7th century royal inscription from Ekron, the predecessors of King Akish of Ekron are recorded as Padi, Yasid, Ada and Yair. The earliest of these rulers, Yair, would correspond to the late 9th century BCE, with his son Ada possibly ruling Ekron at the turn of the century. By that time, the city of Ashdod appears to have gained control over Gath, with both cities reportedly at war with the Kingdom of Judah, ruled by King Azariah. Although the Bible records Azariah's victories, the king passed away in about 740 BCE, after which the situation was reversed and Philistines were able to temporarily capture several cities in Judah, including Bet Shemesh, Gizmo and Soko, among others. In the second part of the 8th century BCE, we finally start recording both names and whereabouts of the Philistine kings from the vast majority of their cities. This is thanks to the expansion of the new great power of the age, the Assyrian Empire, which began its operations throughout Levant during the reign of Tiglath-Pileser III. After his conquest of the powerful kingdom of Urartu, Tiglath turned southwards towards Levant. The Assyrian king reports that several Levantine states rebelled against this Assyrian expansion centered around the Aramean kingdom of Damascus. The Aramean allies included the kingdom of Israel, the Phoenician city of Tyre, as well as the Philistine city-states. Perhaps the most powerful city of the Philistine Pentapolis was Ascalon, ruled by King Metinti or Matit. He was supported by the fellow Philistine king Hanan or Haino, the ruler of Gaza. This alliance notably did not include the kingdom of Judah. Unfortunately for the allies, the coalition was not able to withstand the Assyrians, and in 732 BCE, Tiglath-Pileser destroyed the Arameans and took the city of Damascus. Tiglath also annexed the northern part of Israel, with the southern part becoming his vassal. All of Levant was now either conquered or paying tribute to the Assyrians. Following the defeat of the coalition, Metinti of Ascalon was deposed by Rukiptu, who thus became the new ruler of the city and a vassal to the Assyrian Empire. 
As Stiglet Pileser was marching through Levant and subsequently Philistia, King Hanan of Gaza had no choice but to flee to save his life. Hanan thus escaped to Egypt. Whether he expected Egyptian aid in regaining Philistine independence is unknown. The Egyptians were not able nor willing to oppose Assyria, forcing Hanan to reconsider his options. Eventually he returned to Gaza, where he was reinstated as a vassal king by Tiglat Pileser. Other Philistine rulers, Azuri of Ashdod and Padi of Akron, also acknowledged the new Assyrian overlord, placing all of Philistia under the vassalage of Ashur. Tiglath passed away in 727 BCE and was succeeded by his son Shalmaneser V. This moment was used by Egypt's 22nd dynasty to attempt to break the Assyrian hold over Canaan, and soon the pharaoh Azarkan IV entered negotiations with the Ram state of Israel, after which the Israelite king refused to continue paying tribute to the Assyrians. For Shalmaneser, this meant war, and a large Assyrian army was dispatched towards Israel's capital Samaria in about 725 BCE. When the Israelite ruler Hoshea realized that there would be no help coming from the Egyptians, he quickly attempted to resume paying tribute, but it was too late. Shalmaneser imposed a grueling siege on the city, which lasted for three years, until the Israelite capital finally fell. What happened to Hoshea is unknown, as he disappears from the historical record. As Samaria was being conquered in 722, Shalmaneser V was suddenly deposed and his throne seized by Sargon II. Sargon reportedly finished the annexation of Israel and deported more than 27,000 Israelites into inner Assyria, which was a typical Assyrian strategy used to prevent potential future rebellions. This event resulted in the disappearance of 10 out of 12 traditional Israelite tribes. The two remaining tribes, those of Judah and Benjamin, as well as some members of the priestly tribe of Levi, inhabited the kingdom of Judah, which yet again had not joined the rebellion. Philistines also wisely chose not to rebel, but rather to wait for a potentially better opportunity. Turbulence in other Assyrian regions, however, was probably giving hope to the rulers of Philistia that the right moment would soon come. In Ascalon, King Rukiptu died and was succeeded by Sitka, who stayed compliant with tribute to Assyria, at least for a time. In Ashdod, King Azuri was reportedly the first among the Philistines to attempt to avoid his tributary obligations. Assyrian sources record Azuri making a plot to skirt the tribute in about 713 BCE. The Assyrian army soon responded, led by either Sargon or one of his generals. Once in Ashdod, the Assyrians deposed Azuri and installed his brother Ahimiti on the throne. Shortly after the Assyrians left, Ahimiti himself was overthrown and the throne seized by a man named the Amani which in the Akkadian language reportedly means Aeonian. In 712, while Sargon II was dealing with a rebellion in southern Anatolia, Yamani launched a revolt of his own. He turned to Pharaoh Shabitku, who had just united Egypt under his rule, for help. However, he was denied, as the Egyptians did not want to risk military conflict with the Assyrian king. The only ruler that joined Yamani was King Hanan of Gaza. Once done with the rebellions elsewhere, Sargon returned and invaded Philistia with his army. Ashdod was quickly defeated, with its dependency, the city of Gath, apparently destroyed by the Assyrians. King Yamani managed to escape, fleeing to Egypt. Sargon's army proceeded south, where they were met by Hanan of Gaza in the Battle of Raphath. Gazans were no match for the mighty Assyrian army. 
Hanan was decisively defeated and captured by the Assyrians. He was put in chains and brought to Ashur, his further faith unknown. In Gaza he was succeeded by a pro-Assyrian ruler, Silbel. Yamani apparently managed to hide in Egypt for a few years, but he too was captured and extradited by the Egyptians to Sargon. Yamani's name likewise disappears from further records. He was succeeded by Mitinti of Ashdod. With Levant pacified, King Sargon soon marched north to crush yet another rebellion in Tabal in 705 BCE. This would be Sargon's last campaign, as his army was ambushed in Anatolia and the Assyrian king himself was killed. This Assyrian disaster sent shockwaves across the empire, especially due to the fact that king not only fell in battle, but that his body was lost to the enemy. His son and successor, Sennacherib, would soon have to deal not only with the existing campaign in which the Assyrians were defeated, but also with the revolts across the empire inspired by the perceived weakness of Assyria. In Levant, King Hezekiah of Judah immediately stopped paying his annual tribute. He was supported by the Egyptians, who looked to create a strong buffer between themselves and Assyria. Hezekiah also recruited a strong force of Arab mercenaries and became central figure to the rebellion in southern Canaan. The Phoenician city-states also revolted, as well as Sidka, the king of Ascalon. Sennacherib's biggest threat, however, came from Babylonia, where Marduk Ablaidina seized the throne in 703. While Sennacherib was dealing with Tabal and Babylon, the Levantine alliance was growing stronger and preparing for war. However, not everyone decided to join the revolt. King Padi of Ekron was a staunch pro-Assyrian ruler and refused to take arms. He was subsequently deposed by a faction friendly to Hezekiah and handed over to the king of Judah, who imprisoned Padi in Jerusalem. Still, Metinti of Ashdod and Silbel of Gaza were hesitant to take any action against Assyria and ultimately decided against joining the revolt. Likewise, the nearby rulers of Ammon, Moab and Edom stood down and did not challenge the Assyrian authority. This proved to be a wise decision, as Sennacherib eventually defeated Tabal and crushed the revolt in Babylonia. In 701, his army embarked on a campaign in Canaan. Assyrians first reached Phoenicia, where Alulaios of Tyre fled to Cyprus rather than face the imperial army. After installing pro-Assyrian rulers there, Sennacherib moved towards Philistia, where he destroyed Joppa, Beth Dagon, Banai Barca, and Azuru. This forced Sidka to resubmit, after which he was replaced by Sharuludari, the son of Sidga's predecessors, Rukiptu. As Sennacherib approached Ekron, Egypt decided to intervene and sent an expeditionary force to halt the Assyrian advance. However, Sennacherib was not to be stopped. The Egyptians were defeated, and the Assyrian king took Ekron, continuing his advance towards the kingdom of Judah. After besieging and capturing two important cities, Azekah and Lachish, the Assyrians imposed the blockade of Jerusalem and had its supplies cut off. Eventually, King Hezekiah was forced to accept Sennacherib as the overlord and pay tribute. He also released Padi from captivity, who was subsequently reinstalled by Sennacherib as king in Akron. All three of the Philistine rulers that did not rebel against Assyria were rewarded, receiving portions of the territory taken away from the kingdom of Judah. In the subsequent period, the Assyrians kept firm control over Levant. Philistine rulers were now loyal Assyrian subjects, as was the kingdom of Judah, which had lost any capacity to oppose the imperial rule. 
Additionally, the Arabic tribes to the south, most notably the kingdom of Adumatu, recognized the overlordship of the Assyrian king. In 681 BCE, King Sennacherib was assassinated in Ashur by two of his conspiring sons. However, his favorite son and designated successor as Harhadon prevailed in a quick struggle over the throne, defeated his rivals and was thus crowned the new Assyrian king. Although a Phoenician ruler in Sidon attempted to seize the opportunity and revolt, both Philistines and Judeans stayed loyal to the imperial authority. In Ekron, the aging king Padi passed away and was succeeded by his son Akish. In Ascalon, Sharaludari was apparently removed from power and succeeded by King Metinti II, the son of Sidka. The reason for this is not known. Either way, Asarhadon arrived to the region in 677 and crushed the revolt. He further reassessed his authority over the Arabs and led several invasions against Egypt under Pharaoh Taharqa, finally succeeding in seizing the provinces around the Nile Delta in 671 BCE. It is at this point that Sharuludari re-emerges as an Assyrian appointed governor of the city of Pelusia. Esarhaddon also recognized Necho I as the pharaoh of the Nile Delta, who thus became vassal to the Assyrians. Throughout the next two years, Esarhaddon was busy dealing with a conspiracy that emerged against him throughout Assyria, which provided an opportunity for Pharaoh Taharqa to return to Lower Egypt and re-establish his rule in 669 BCE. Taharqa made a deal with both Sharuludari and Neho, as well as a local prince named Pakruru, where the Nile Delta was split between the rulers, who were now the governors of Egypt under Pharaoh Taharqa. Upon hearing the news, Esarhaddon raised his army once again and headed towards Egypt. However, the Assyrian king suddenly died in Haran in the same year, being succeeded by his son Asurbanipal. Asurbanipal continued his father's expedition and in 667 the Assyrian army was back in Egypt. Asurbanipal managed to defeat Taharqa, who subsequently once again withdrew into upper territories. The Assyrian king thus reconquered the Nile Delta, also capturing Neko, Pakuru and Sharuludari, who were then brought to Ashur. Asurbanipal then pardoned Neho, who soon returned to Sais where he was reinstalled as the Assyrian client in the charge of Lower Egypt. Pakruru was also pardoned and he too returned to serve the Assyrians together with Neho. Sharuludari, however, is never again mentioned in the Assyrian sources, likely dying in captivity. Throughout the following decades, the Assyrian hold over Levant remained relatively firm. In Egypt, Neho I was killed in 665 BCE in another war against the rival dynasty from the upper Egypt. Asurbanipal intervened and installed Neho's son, Psamthik I, in size in Lower Egypt. Over time, Psamtik was able to unify all of Egypt under his rule, becoming de facto independent from the Assyrian influence. Asurbanipal passed away in 631 BCE, after which the Assyrian Empire fell into steep decline. Various parts of the empire broke away and became independent, most notably the city of Babylon. Sensing the Assyrian weakness, the Babylonians were able to make alliance with the rising Median Kingdom of Iran and quickly conquer large portions of Assyria. In Levant, Pharaoh Samtik used the vacuum in power to expand his own influence. According to Herodotus, the Pharaoh carried out a 29-year siege of Ashdod in an attempt to expand into Philistia. 
Samtik expanded his military operations into Levant, as he supported the collapsing Assyrians against the Babylonians and Medes, as well as Scythians who were using the opportunity themselves to make incursions southwards. It is during this time that we record the final Philistine king, named Adon. It is unknown which exact Philistine city Adon ruled over, as his letter sent to the Egyptian pharaoh is not fully preserved. Either way, it was clear that Babylonians had conquered the Assyrian heartland and were about to make moves against the Levantine coast. In Egypt, Samtik was succeeded by his son Neho II in 610 BCE. Adon evidently sided with Necho against the Babylonians, ruled by King Nebuchadnezzar. In neighboring Judah, however, King Yosia was firmly opposed to Egypt and attempted to halt Necho's advance. The battle was fought in Megiddo in 609, with the Egyptians securing a decisive victory. King Yosia was killed in the process, being succeeded by his son Jehoahazen. Neho continued and captured Kadesh, and then joined forces with Ashurdobalit II, the final ruler of the Rump Assyrian state. Neho and Ashurdobalit went on to lay siege on Haran, but were ultimately defeated by the Babylonian Median alliance. Once back to southern Canaan, Neho deposed Jehoahazin in Judah, taking him prisoner and replacing him with Jehoiakim. By 605, the pharaoh was back to Levant and marched all the way north to Carchemish, where the decisive battle was fought against the Babylonians and the Medes. The Babylonian army was led by the crown prince Nebuchadnezzar, who would soon become the new king. Egyptians were decisively defeated, thus ending their intervention in the Near East. The Babylonians continued their conquest. Nebuchadnezzar arrived to Phoenicia by 604, where he secured oaths from the Phoenician rulers. He then moved on Philistia, which has consistently supported the Egyptian pharaoh. King Adon reported on Nebuchadnezzar's movements to Neho in a letter known as the Adon Papyrus. The Philistine king warned that the Babylonians were encamping at Aphek and asked for troops to be sent to aid him against Nebuchadnezzar. Unfortunately for the Philistines, no sufficient help arrived, and Nebuchadnezzar soundly defeated the Philistine army. He conquered the cities of Ascalon, Ekron, and likely Ashdod, which were subsequently destroyed. Babylonian sources record that the king of Ascalon was captured and taken to Babylon, which might have been King Adon himself. Either way, Adon disappears from the written record at this point. Nebuchadnezzar continued his expedition for several more years, forcing the Judeans to pay him tribute and ultimately marching on Egypt at 601 BCE. However, at the Battle of Migdal, Neho came out victorious and captured the city of Gaza, forcing Nebuchadnezzar to conclude his campaign. This campaign brought an end to Philistia, as the Philistines disappeared from the written record at this time. By 587, the kingdom of Judah would be destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar as well, leading to the infamous deportation of the Judeans to Babylon, better known as the Babylonian captivity. Eventually, Babylon itself would be conquered by Cyrus the Great of Persia, who would permit the Judeans to return to Jerusalem. By that time, the Philistians were gone, but not forgotten. Name Philistia would be preserved by the Greeks and later Romans as Palestini or Palestine, which continued to be variously used to this day.